There wasn't much happening in Tampa during the Civil War, or for that matter, after the Civil War. The Industrial Revolution was pumping new money into the North, but it was bypassing the South. It was also the time of the Gilded Age, La Belle Epoque, a time of opulence and leisure. In Tampa, there was plenty of leisure, but not much opulence. It was a sleepy little town. Uh, they were mainly uh, in the vegetable business, and uh, they raised oranges. Uh, all of downtown Tampa was an orange grove, you might say. And they did a lot of fishing. So it, it was a, a small community, just uh, barely existing, you might say. There was very little contact with the outside world. Railroads would finally make that contact. A tremendous system of trains and boats was reaching into the southeast like veins feeding a beating heart. Connecticut-born Henry Bradley Plant was building up his empire, the Plant System. And so he would be in the express business uh, throughout the Civil War uh, and then uh, uh, up until around 1879. And then he went into the railroad business, financing and also taking over bankrupt ones. But he began to acquire railroads leading into Florida. Plant brought the first railroad into Tampa in 1884. He developed Port Tampa with a deep water channel and connected the rail to his steamship line. He literally opened up trade within the state and from Florida into the Caribbean jump-starting this tiny port community into the 20th century. When he brought the railroad here, the, a tremendous fishing industry moved in, which brought in a lot of business, a lot of, a lot of money, and they were shipping it by railroad all over the country. But the, the big impact was when Mr. Ebor, who had his factory in Key West, when he realized that the railroad had come to Tampa, he moved his factory here, and within about 10 years, from 720 population, Tampa had about 15,000 people. The economy was on the move. Plant already had one hotel in Tampa, but what he really wanted was to build a luxury resort, a magical place for Florida's booming tourism industry. He brought in John A. Wood from New York for the project, a relatively unknown architect. Wood comes up with a picturesque, romantic, revival style that's Moorish, Oriental, Byzantine, all the terminology is used in the, the newspaper descriptions of the building. The Tampa Bay Hotel reflected Plant's taste. He was a collector at heart and had the optimism and enthusiasm to trust his own sense of taste. Wood's combination of styles was eclectic. A crescent moon top shining Byzantine minaret circled by cantilevered balconies, gracing floor after floor of long Gothic windows, gingerbread woodwork, ornamental skewbacks, and keyhole arches all provided detail. Long decorative verandas lined the main building. Somehow it all fit together. It was a massive undertaking, employing many local and out-of-state master craftsmen. The building began to take shape slowly. But then, a year into the project, Henry Plant made some radical changes to Wood's plan, expanding the hotel. The parlor suites were added, as well as an entire floor of rooms. Altogether, there would be more than 500 rooms on six acres of land is really so handsome. His way of curving the whole building and kind of pulling the dining room off to the side. I, you know, I don't know what went through his thought process, but I do know that a client that adds 50 rooms and a new dining room when you're under construction would be enough to stress anybody. <laughs> Wood eventually became ill, but the work continued. Across the globe, the Paris Expo was the rage, showing off everything new and modern. Henry Plant was there. He raised the American flag in a ceremony, and he set up an exhibit on the South's industry. Then he and his wife Margaret embarked on a European buying expedition, 
sending 41 train loads of furnishings back to Tampa. And what a collection it was. French furniture, said to have belonged to Marie Antoinette and Prince Louis Philippe. Cabinets from the palaces of Spain and China. Mirrors from Venice. 30,000 square yards of red lined carpet picked up at British auction. A Mayulica vase made specially for the Vienna Exposition and many fanciful bronze sculptures. Plant was building a kingdom like nothing anyone had ever seen. But he did enjoy it, and he had enough money to play around. Uh, roughly 30 or 40 million at that time, well then he would, uh, uh, spending of $3 million at the most for this hotel was a nice play thing. Plant spared no expense. He brought in exotic tropical plants never before seen in Florida and Florida's first elevator went into the lobby. On February 5th, 1891, the hotel opened with a bang. 2,000 guests attended a grand ball. The next day's New York Times called the hotel one of the grandest in the country. This was Florida's first all-electric, steam-heated, completely fireproofed hotel, and it was dazzling. So Florida was, was touted in the press as, a, as an exotic destination. And that sense of the exotic is probably why Plant must have wanted a Moorish Oriental style building. That's immediate publicity. It gives a sense of place to a town that may not have too much of a sense of place, which was the, the case with young developing Tampa. Now the hotel would go on to become what Plant had really wanted, a tropical resort. He added an elaborate boathouse and a casino with a floor that rolled back to reveal an indoor swimming pool. There was an 18-hole golf course, a separate exhibition hall, and a racetrack. The hotel came alive with horse races, croquet, bowling, boating, golfing, horseshoes, swimming, billiards, shuffleboard, fishing, even hunting. There was music, theater, and dance. The first season brought more than 4,000 guests. You had the elite of America coming here constantly. And uh, of course, they would tell their friends, they would write, and they, they, so they, they, had, they had a beautiful period there for about 10 years. But it would take a war to finally bring the resort into the world spotlight, the Spanish-American War. Plant was a very well-connected fellow, so he used his influence to make Tampa the center of operations. Now, Plant uh, had a lieutenant, and I believe his name was Brown, and when he sees all these preparations for war, too, he decides then to go up to Washington, D.C., and he talks to the cabinet and he talks to the president, and as a result, uh, Tampa is chosen as one of the uh, places of embarkation. The Tampa Bay Hotel was jammed with officers, dignitaries, and journalists. In fact, it was the first time the hotel had been fully occupied. 128 press passes were issued for writers from all over the world. There was Stephen Crane, Richard Harding Davis, and Frederick Remington. Clara Barton arrived to organize the Red Cross. And on the verandas, the Army generals settled into their rocking chairs, waiting for the word to leave for Cuba. Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders encamped in the field, but at night, he'd visit his wife at the hotel. When you think of Tampa being uh, swamped with 20,000 mules and horses overnight, and then uh, about 30,000 soldiers, it was incredible. But the populace of Tampa was delighted because they were doing a fantastic business. At night, the hotel was a wall-to-wall -wall celebration with soldiers in the bar, the dining room, and outside on the grounds. But in the daytime, the heat climbed to a devastating 110 degrees. The dust in Tampa was stifling. A logistical mess developed in the rail yards where Plant's single rail line backed up for miles. Perishables rotted. Soldiers turned to the residents of the city. They had very little to eat, and they would come in and robes begging for food. 
and with those eight in our family, we would just get up and let them come and sit down and eat. For a month of the five-month war, the hotel prospered and Plant's dream lived. But a year later, at 79 years of age, Henry Plant died of a heart attack. His heirs had no interest in what was now called Plant's Folly. It seems the tourists weren't flocking to the Tampa Bay Hotel. It sold to the city of Tampa in 1905 for $125,000, a far cry from the nearly three million it cost to build. The idea of decoration and color and dark red brick and vertical Victorian proportions was on the decline. And a Spanish Renaissance classical, cleaner, neater look was advancing. So Plant ended up with a, a building that's, that's wonderful, but um, a building that looked backward in the 19th century. But Tampa embraced the hotel and Plant Park. It became a meeting and social center for the city. The Expo Hall held the first Florida State Fair. When the season was on, it was very, the only lively place in town. <laughs> Those days, dances were much lovelier than I've seen anything lately. They, they're so formal and so, so polite, so well-mannered. There was no loud talk. There was no fancy dancing. There was no hip swinging. There was just a beautiful waltz or a, a square dance, and uh, everybody had a good time. But the good times didn't last. Florida's land boom went bust in 1926. Then the stock market crashed. Tourism plummeted, and the hotel declined over the years. The boathouse and the servants' quarters were demolished, and the casino burned down. Some of the furnishings that hadn't been sold just disappeared. Finally, in 1933, the H.B. Plant Museum was established by the city to help preserve the old building and the legacy of Henry Plant. Now, like a proud beacon of another time, the Tampa Bay Hotel still stands. It's an official National Historic Landmark and a vibrant reminder of the need to preserve the past and of one entrepreneur's dream for Florida's first magic kingdom. What makes it very special, I think, really are the minarets. And it has become the symbol for the city of Tampa. No other place in this country has a grand hotel with minarets in it. This gets kind of taken to the ultimate level of grandioseness absolute fantasy, come to Florida and be someplace that you could hardly imagine. Probably the only regret is it's no longer a hotel, so we can't stay here. <laughs>